Welcome to another Café Rollist. Uh, there's been a bit of a mix-up on my side regarding time zones, which are always a nightmare. It's a, it's a classic at the RPG Academy as well. Uh, last year for the little story, I missed a RPG session which was organized in part for me just because I had the time zones completely wrong. But anyway, it's 2 p.m. <coughs> BST, British Summer Time, because we moved from... GMT to BST recently, so that's confusing. And on the other side, it, in EDT, we are not at 10 a.m., but we are at 9 a.m. And uh, yeah, I'm joined by uh, two charming individuals. Could you introduce yourself, maybe starting with Logan? Yeah, uh, I'm Logan with uh, Storm Giant Games. <laughs> Is that what? What level of introduction do we want? My, <laughs> my name's My name's Remy. You can um, raise and, the bar uh, if you want. You know, Logan. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. For you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, my name's Remy. Also, a, I, I want to say like co-founder of Storm Giant Games, but it's just me and Logan. Um, uh, uh, you know, he does a, a lot more of the mechanical uh, work in our um, in our uh, uh, the, a lot of the things we create. He does a lot of the item balancing, creature balancing, stuff like that. A lot of stat blocks. I do a lot more of the fluff uh text um both of us do the marketing work uh the graphic design website all of that stuff um and uh yeah yeah so we, we kind of share everything we don't really have roles but i'm remy and we're both in ohio uh, oh so you're I'm you're a... close to the rpg academy and academic online in Day dayton i guess if my yeah. geography yes is... yes we're yeah so yeah we're about correct. 45 minutes 45 minutes or so from dayton have you ever been to academic no I wish you should. Uh, you should go there, get a sponsor table and everything. I'll, I'll get you in touch with uh, Michael from the faculty who created the the show, which was uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a bit more than a show now. There there are several shows, but uh, it's a very good folks, a bunch of good folks, and um, I've heard that the convention was very very nice. And I believe they would be interested in the kind of products you do at Storm Giant Games. Could you tell us a bit what what these are? Yeah, Logan, do you want to? Uh, yeah, no, go ahead. All right. Um, Don't fight. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, oh, I just want to make, I talk a lot. I want to make sure that I'm not like trampling people. Um, so far, so we, we, we started relatively uh, recently. And so far we'd been um, running only uh, so social media where we had been uh, putting out loot tables for, uh, for different enemies. We had been putting out uh, campaign hooks or, or uh, adventure hooks for, for Dungeons and Dragons also, as well as, um, uh, as well as tips for DMs and players. And we've been putting all of those out as little graphics on our site and offering to them uh, in a, a nice downloadable way uh, for, for patrons. But recently, um, what was it, uh, March 12th? Was that when The Looking Glass came out? We uh, we released our first uh, our first publication. That's a PDF only right now, but it's a a little bit more than fifty pages, and it's an introduction to a new campaign setting. Uh, uh, there's an adventure in it, a bunch of new monsters and items and spells uh, in there, and uh, additionally, we have some uh, some T-shirt designs that we've done. But we we plan primarily to uh, uh, at the moment, although we have a, a lot of ideas and a lot of things that we're working on, to continue with the Looking Glass as a monthly. Uh, issues kind of akin to some of the uh, uh, pulp uh, novellas or pulp comics um, where the setting and the adventures kind of build upon each other on a monthly basis. Um, so uh, the, the first issue is out and that's going to be the biggest one probably, but uh, it, we tend to uh, continue to push ourselves and make stuff way longer than we want it to be. Um, but uh, yeah, that's our, that's our uh, primary product really right now is, uh, is the looking glass and the subsequent adventures that we're working on, uh, for afterwards. Um, but, uh, uh, most of our, uh, most of our activity is on our Instagram for our, our free tables and, uh, uh, ideas that we post on there. Yeah. I didn't realize when you contacted me uh, about crowd control that, uh, you were the, the guys behind the, I loot the bodies because I've seen those, uh, tables, uh, coming in and out uh, on, on different social media. They're, they're really cool uh, sort of things. Are they available pre-printed in a format or as card decks or things like that? No, we, we, we have them on our, uh, on our Patreon as downloadable PDFs where you can get them all at once. Uh, we've had some discussion about maybe doing them as, as a printed, maybe in a publication or as cards, but we were kind of waiting until we had a little bit more of them done 
uh, to warrant something like that before we kind of got went before we went there really. Cool. Also, we uh, I'm a I'm a, by trade a, a user interface designer, and uh, Lowing does a lot of digital uh, marketing in his work too, and so. Uh, designing for print is like a it's it's like a whole different uh, a whole different yeah. ball game, and um, uh, we'd have to reformat some stuff, get get some other things ready. But um, you know, we hope uh, next summer maybe when everyone's healthy and uh, meeting each other in person again, we hope to be out at some some cons and have some physical items. But right now, everything we've got is digital, which is suiting for for the times when everyone's stuck at home. You know what I mean? It's it's all right for right now to have all digital. And that was the reason you contacted me in the first place. So you have crowd control coming. Uh, sadly, well, thankfully for people who don't know what to do this weekend and who don't speak French, it's this weekend. Uh, I'm saying sadly because I'm already committed to a French online convention, CyberConf. Uh, there is another yeah, yeah, convention called Vir Virtual Oracon, which is also taking place this weekend. And then there's you. Uh, so what is a crowd control expo and uh, yeah you need to pitch it very hard here so because we had the people from virtual <laughs> horror con a couple of days ago well i'll let logan start it off it's like it started out as logan's baby and i wanted i want to hear him tell it yeah so we uh we originally we were kind of um when all this quarantine stuff started happening uh we we moved our uh, personal like our home game over to digital and we were playing on zoom and we were kind of adapting to everything and it worked well for us but we didn't realize until a couple weeks in how much a lot of the rest of the community was affected by this when we saw a lot of people who typically play at home who maybe didn't know how to use zoom and they were frustrated because they weren't able to play and we saw a lot of businesses who were kind of struggling because at the time nobody's you know, people are buying less things right now as far as uh, RPG accessories, any, you know, dice, modules, t-shirts, stuff like that. It's just, you know, it, it's been affected a little bit. So we've seen a lot of the businesses and the community kind of struggling with that. So we are kind of, you know, wondering if we could create a way where we could get everyone together. Uh, almost it, it, the idea started almost as a directory, an online directory of small businesses where you can go and, and support them and uh, be able to find uh, other people in the community that you can help support and purchase from rather than maybe purchasing from uh, a big online supplier like Amazon or something like that. So we started it kind of as a directory and it really just evolved over a few days as we started putting out polls and uh, questions on our social media about what people would like to see and people said oh it'd be cool if you if you also maybe did uh, some panels where there were some people from these small businesses speaking and then a couple people said oh, I you know I would love to run a game on a live stream and maybe that will help people interact if they're on the twitch chat and stuff like that so it really kind of evolved into just being basically a lot of the stuff that you would find at a convention but online and we just kind of took that concept and, and ran with it. And we're, we're really happy with how much it's kind of uh, gotten some traction and, and how many people have been interested. We've got a, like a diverse array of topics that people are going to be speaking about. I think we've got a good, um, a, a, you know, a good diverse uh, types of games that are being run and stuff like that. So. Yeah. So it was actually, so on, on my end of the, uh, of the spectrum with crowd control. I'm, you know, I stuff at work has been really crazy stuff that personally has been crazy. And uh, I was uh, putting on most of my focus into the next issue of the looking glass. And I saw Logan doing some of the stuff and I like saw the directory and I was like, Oh, that's cool. So like businesses, my mom uh, used to go to use uh, conventions and things like that um, to make her money for rent for the summer uh, as a face painter and hen artist. And so I knew people who would normally get a booth somewhere, uh, when they weren't able to get that booth and make that money, that could be potentially really impactful, you know? Um, so when I saw him doing the directory, I was like, that's really cool. That's a really nice thing to do um, to be able to just like uh, maybe help people have a place to find stuff and, and, and get some exposure to some creators. And then I like went back to working on the looking glass and like doing regular work stuff. And the next thing I know, I feel like I turned around and we had this like packed schedule of streaming events and we had people running games on their own discords that they were getting players 
to join from our site. We had like 250 registrants for some free thing. And I was like, Logan, what did you do? What happened? And, um, and uh, so then we, we did, made the schedule and the other day we learned how to run the streaming stuff. Like it was very like fast and organic. And I, I feel like I literally was like, working on this adventure and then I turned around and I was like, we have 250 people coming to what, you know what I mean? So like I, uh, there's um, uh, a little bit of anxiety around it, I guess, but it's really cool to see, you can, you can see the like pent up energy of people wanting to communicate with each other and wanting to do something by the fact that like accidentally we, we had this thing that was supposed to just be a website with links to dice makers and mini painters and stuff like that, that, that turned into, you know, kind of a, a community asset so it's been it's been cool to watch it who knows what will happen when we do it it's our first time and like i said uh like we were talking about before uh, we came in it's like maybe that will be the charm or maybe that will be the the black hole of doom but um <laughs> it, it's been uh it's been weird it's been weird and fun to like watch it uh, kind of become its own thing it's fascinating really the appetite of the community for 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 something to engage into uh, and doing a, an event together online uh, and that's something again uh, this weekend uh, we got France but we also had on the show people from Portugal doing Concordia which is mm. not exactly a convention but it's also something trying to to gather everything around and have the energy of all those tabletop RPG fans who want to do things to engage with one another and uh, they find a, an avenue to do it through through that what what I find interesting in what you are describing to me is how you you started the other way around than the other convention I, I talked to. The others kind of started with either the games or maybe the panels and the seminars. You are coming from the trade all. So it's really you you sound really like you are business supporting uh sellers supporting kind of approach. How do you what shape are you planning that to to have? Because if I'm in a trade hall, I wander between the, the alleys and I see the different booth and I, I wave at people. It's a, it's a bit random and there's, of course, the impulse buying and this sort of things. Or do you, or did you find a way to represent those different stores uh, digitally? Yeah, so one of the things that we did uh, on the website is we have a sort of a, uh, a page that's sorted by category. So we'll, we have uh, different categories that represent, you know, um, there, there's a category for dice, there's a category for minis, for map makers, t-shirts, any category that sh you can think of really that would have products that you would want to buy. So if you were looking for something specific, you would be able to kind of visit the site and, you know, oh, I'm looking for dice. Let me go to the dice category. Here's you know, 20 or 25 dice makers and I'll browse their stuff. Uh, as far as kind of the random aspect of it and, you know, finding something that maybe you weren't looking for, uh, one of the things that we are still figuring out how we're going to do, but we're looking at um, implementing is we're going to do kind of a Zoom lobby that uh, at the convention where we're going to have a lobby where it's just an open Zoom chat. Everyone can get together, jump in at any time to hang out and talk to each other. And we hope that that will be able to grant some additional exposure to these businesses because not only can they jump in and kind of talk with people about their products if they want to, but then you might jump in and you might hear, you know, person A and person B talking about, oh, I was just looking at these dice and these dice are really cool. And you overhear that and you go to the website and you, you know, check out the page. So we hope that the Zoom, you know, lobby is kind of what we're calling it, will be able to supplement that as well to have people discussing the stuff they're looking at, maybe just discussing RPGs in general. But at some point, you're, you're going to have people who are talking about the products and local businesses and, and these businesses who want to come in and, and just engage with their customer base. So, you know, it'd be really cool, actually, that you brought up. How do you say your name? Is it Kalam? Kalum. Kalum, um, that, that you brought up about that kind of like randomly stumbling into stuff. I wonder if we could um, put in uh, put in a button that's just like uh, that's just like a, a random a randomizer. Like a, uh, yeah, that just like gives you a like gives you a booth. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just like, like forwards you to their page. The um, feeling lucky button. Yeah, Google, basically. Yeah. yeah, where it's just like I want to just like stumble through the booths. I don't freaking know what I'm looking for. Um, that would be kind of a cool idea that may be able to replicate that feeling a little bit. Like 
I have, I, I just watched a thing last night of somebody unveiling a Larry Elmore painting. And um, I have a signed Elmore uh, a print in our D and D room in here. And um, it, uh, that like, I, I knew his art from Dragonlance books and things like that. And I was at a convention and I was like, I saw an old guy at the table signing stuff. And I was like, I wonder, you know, I wasn't going to go buy one of his prints. And then I saw him sitting there and there's like that kind of, that's that, that strange, like visceral engagement. That's really, really hard to replicate because of course, like it would be pretty uh, difficult or, or weird to have each person like sitting in a zoom room at their, <laughs> at their booth that you could like stumble onto and engage with. Um, but I think any, any ideas that we can find that really um, replicate that that sense of kind of exploration uh, that you get at a con is is something that would be um, really cool for us to explore in the future. Um, of course, it, in the week that everything came together, we you were the first one to bring up that thought. So I think that's like, that's something that we should really I think that's something we should really play with. So, well, I, yeah. I was curious yeah. because uh, it's not exactly my my idea because uh, I was mentioning the French convention and what they're doing and uh, I, I haven't been to the, their discord this morning the, the convention actually st already started but uh, people were interested to could have so either uh, businesses could pay for one uh, I don't know a uh, minor contribution or people already contributing in other ways like me running a seminar we could have what they call a stand uh, which practic practically is a chat room on their discord so you go in the, the their Discord, which is the their main interface for the convention, and you got this list with different subcategories of uh, closed chat room, one for each. Like if there are five tabletop podcasters, each will have their own little chat room, and they can oh. be hanging out there or not, and people can show up and or get in or get out. But on so I'm already curious to see how it will go. They asked me for visual material and information for them to do something in there. I haven't had a look yet uh, because I was busy with organizing the seminar. But on top of that, on top of this idea that people can jump in and out of different chat rooms and see if someone is there, and you got this kind of experience, like uh, in the way you you describing uh, last November, I was in Dragon Meet, and at some point. I wanted to interview some people from Chaosium and I found them on a middle floor and then at the table there there was a guy signing books. I was not paying much attention. Uh, my interest was interviewing someone I knew, Linardi, and then I realized it was a, a rather famous novelist there informally signing up stuff because he happened to be in that thing. So so yeah, it's it will be interesting to see all those different conventions, including your own coming up with ideas and new ways of engaging online because until now we had Academic Online for instance for Academic but we've been struggling to draw people in that experience uh, and it's been mostly limited to to running games and having people join games so it will be interesting how how people can engage with one another and see and see if we end up with a online gen con i mean it might be crowd control i hope so <laughs> Which would be like, you know, the <laughs> really popular one, which sort of have this critical mass of things uh, going on or for maybe for a local area or something wider. But it's interesting to see how now people which would, did not engage that much. There were sort of two bubbles in the Venn diagram. People who do online stuff and people who don't. And they, they're sort of slowly overlapping because of the yeah, situation yeah. that's pushing people to, to try to, to engage online. Uh, one question. Yeah, I, it, it is yep. really interesting. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I was just I was just thinking about that same thing because we're like really we're really a, about a playing in person and sitting here uh, at this this table and playing and just our experience with like you know before we when other people wanted to like stream in with us or something or someone was out of town and be like eh, I don't really know no nah, if you're not here you're not here you know what I mean and now that we've been doing this it's been. Uh, even just with our game, with our home game, it's been really interesting to see how much we've taken to it and how much we've learned from it and will take with us into the future, even after, uh, you know, after things have settled down, that it's like kind of become a part of the way that we that we interact with D&D. &D. So um, I, I it, it will be interesting to see the way that the community, like as a whole, changes from that, that central point in the Venn diagram, like the people who were all physical, in-person, how much of the digital they keep with them afterwards is something to uh, think about. Uh, what was I about to say? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, that's a question gotcha. I asked everybody. Uh, it's sort of what you you were trying uh, already starting uh, to answer, but. Uh, do you see long-term impact of what is going on at the moment for for the community and what what this impact could be could be like yeah i i do i mean i don't i don't really know the answer to what that is well, i don't, I don't know think what anyone knows like, but, but it's but fun to speak yeah <laughs> I, I i think i think you know a lot of uh a lot of inventions and innovations are born out of necessity and i think you know we as a whole, you know, and this isn't unique to the, the tabletop community. I think a lot of different industries right now are just kind of figuring things out as we go. You know, there's a lot of people that are learning how to do the Zoom thing. There's a lot of people who are trying to figure out how to do the Roll20 thing in Discord. And I think a lot of this stuff is kind of for a lot of people, they're starting to get an understanding as they go. And a lot of new ideas are, are coming up, you know, a digital convention before a month ago is not something I would have ever even dreamed of. And if it wasn't kind of born out of the necessity of everyone being stuck at home, I probably wouldn't have even been interested in it. I, I you know, because we're such, uh, you know, personal people and we like the, we like the feeling of being physically together and interacting with friends, but it, it's just been a really, uh, it's been really neat to see the evolution of how not only our personal game, but everyone else that we are, are friends with how their game has evolved. You know, not everyone's using Zoom like we are and everyone is finding these new unique ways and we're all learning from each other. I mean, up until last night, uh, we had no idea how to play music on our game. We were just playing and we didn't know how to how to put music through to, to Zoom. And it we, out of necessity, you know, we found uh, a software called, I forget what it was called. Uh, but we found a software where we can kind of plug the music in and it was not something I would have ever looked for otherwise, but we needed to find it. And, you know, it was just kind of a learning experience for us. So I think a lot of those things are happening and I, I don't know what's going to come from it, but I do think that people will be a lot more adaptive and, and be able to uh, bring a lot more of that digital experience with them for sure. It's interesting There's... how people always, you know, when, when you learn history, it's the way it's told is often. And on that year, Gutenberg invited uh, invented press and suddenly people had books and people think okay people, they invented press and then people had book or they invented the iPad and suddenly people had an iPad but people f don't realize that before Gutenberg there were other presses and nobody cared for them that much <laughs> before the iPad <laughs> yeah. they had they had uh, mm. I don't remember Microsoft had one which was it was Zoom was Microsoft had and yeah. but because there was no and demand and necessity and this critical mass of users and as soon as you got this critical mass of users not only people start using the invention but they, they start making use of it in ways which nobody could expect i mean it's like that with the internet yeah. with social media when when tim berners lee invented uh, invented uh, helped with the development of html or internet communication when the darpa commissioned uh, the internet system for the army Nobody envisioned TikTok or, or Zoom or online conventions. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So, Remy, you were yeah. saying, sorry. No, well, I, I, I just, it, it makes me wonder about um, particularly some of the online uh, play utilities. Like, we had tried, um, I'm, I'm moving uh, relatively soon. It's been delayed, uh, obviously, but uh, to, uh, to California, and I'll be, you know, three hour time difference in a country away from, from our, our home game and our group. And so we had been looking at different ways of playing online for the, uh, the incoming change, you know, of me, of me being far away, my, my girlfriend and I being on the other side of the country where both of us, you know, play with, with our, our group all the time. And one of the things we'd looked at was roll 20 <clears throat> and we were like, so overwhelmed by the interface. We were like, ah, this is so much stuff. I can't figure this out. And so like, we just didn't really do a lot of online stuff, but I think through, like you were saying, through the necessity, uh, not only will there be were, will there be new companies born that that are there to fill uh, niches that don't exist, but I think also people will uh, people create workarounds. Like for example, at at work, I use a uh, design software called Figma, and that's actually now what uh, Storm Giant Games uses for all of our uh, design stuff. Um, and Figma is a in the browser design software where you can all, you can like uh, the other designers that I work with, we can all work on the same, the same piece at the same time. 
And so we use Figma for our map where we'll pull up the map and I can send a share link to everyone else we're playing with. And I can use my design software that I'm used to and everyone can go in there and point to where they want their character to go and I'll move the token and things like that. And we're using Zoom on the side. And so like, we couldn't handle the interface of Roll20 at the beginning. I'm, I, I wanna learn more about it now actually because I've seen some really amazing stuff that they do. Yeah. But um, so we created our own replica of that through software that we were used to. I use Zoom at work, I use Figma at work, we combine them together, we know how to use it, you know what I mean? And it, it's, I think there will be these interesting uh, workarounds that, that will happen and will kind of uh, uh, breed these new ideas. Like that, I think that's the, because like what it, you know, what is the, what it, I, I, I think the, the problem um, starts, you know, and the, and the problem in this case is that like uh, not everybody can afford the different uh, things that you need to to have to be able to run things uh, digitally. Not everyone has the technical like prowess to understand those things. Some people don't have the connection, the internet connection, to be able to do it. Um, some some people get nervous being on camera. You know what I mean? There are all of these different uh, these different problems that are. Uh, sitting on top of the original problem of us all being stuck at home that I think will will create some really new and interesting ways of, of playing tabletop RPGs and maybe even create new and interesting tabletop RPGs in and of themselves. Uh, one of the things that kind of like jumped out to Logan and I about this situation that's interesting with the looking glass, uh, our, our setting and our adventures is that it's a like multi-planar hub. It's a it's a, a bar in between uh, all of the planes and all of the worlds in, in Dungeons and Dragons, sort of. And in this bar, um, you have the ability to jump into any campaign world or any setting that that uh, that may exist. Uh, very similar to uh, some of the the old uh, ways that that Dungeons and Dragons were played, where you could come from somebody else's table and be in the same world. You know, you could come with your 14th level fighter and come sit down with your brother's six level wizard and play with them and show them all your cool items and, and do what you've got. And I, and I think like uh, the, that, that planar hub, that, that, that hub in between worlds, like feels like playing with people online. Like we could have you come play with us now. We never had that ability before. Like if you wanted to come and sit at our table and play our home game, we could have your character come through one of those doors with all your stuff that you've got from your game and just come and sit down with us and, and have a good time. And I think like that, you know, the, the, that problem solving and that ability to communicate and, and play and really like make memories and experiences with people you otherwise wouldn't get to connect with is going to breed some really, really cool shit. And I have no, like, if I knew what it was, then I would make it, uh, <laughs> well, the, but uh, I'm not sure what it is yet. What, what's always funny is the, the knock-on effect of things. Uh, it's interesting how some players are in interesting spots, like D&D Beyond as a platform for a lot of resources is quite interesting. Here I've seen, mm -hmm. I was surprised, did not realize that there's no, or if there's one, it's not famous enough so that it's commonly known. Uh, there's a, there's no platform f I know, maybe Roll20 does it, to sign up for games, to find games in an appropriate manner and sign up for them. So, for instance, the, the club here, one of the clubs I'm part of in London, the London RPG community, they have a meetup and they got loads of num or members. But what's interesting, one, they said, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna remove, uh, we're gonna tell people we cannot forbid you from meeting in person, but we won't endorse any physical meeting as part of the club so you cannot use our meetup uh, page to organize games which are in person and they, they looked into doing it for online games which they're doing but they had to make up a, a non-existing imaginary location for the online gaming because meetup as an as a system is actually not developed for online meetings it's, it's developed strictly for physical meeting because i guess that was the the usp uh at the before the situation was turned on its head right now and that but it's funny when you you mentioned that uh, at what point does someone or maybe wizard of the coast they got that their business model of subscription with dnd beyond at what point they say look we could make a platform which would be presented as a mmorpg platform sort of but it's where people play their games and you got World 20, which is integrated and people can jump between one another table and their inventory and all these things and all the objects, they sort of categorize and they, they find. You know, it's always the, the question of 
do small business, f find a a way to grow themselves uh, in into a, dis a situation, or do you have big players who have a, an ecosystem which they develop, develop, and encompass more and more things? It could be uh, as as from the moment when you have a critical mass again of players online, it not only because Wizard is already when you look at World Twenty, you've got you can buy mine of Fendelvers or any D and D supplement, and you got all the maps free program in Roll20, you even have a Fog of War and all of that into the system. If now, instead of having, I don't know, uh, 10,000 players per day on Roll20, you've got 100,000 players, it, it becomes a a business to invest into. Yeah, I like. I really like the idea of, and, and that's kind of something that I was like, dreaming about in regards to the to the looking glass with those those doors but that kind of like a uh that mmo kind of idea is really cool of like being able to just be like i've got some time i wonder if anyone else is is playing you know what i mean and like i've got the you know i like these people who've got a table and i like these people like a table let me ask if the dm would mind if i hopped in you know what i mean and and um the, i think it's one of the things that is interesting to consider i think from like a social level is what sort of restrictions uh you would want to have around um around what kinds of people come to play at your come to play at your table as far as like joining rules um because like if i think about sea of thieves or like some game like that where you're like doing uh like group uh uh you know online random people can come on your boat and you can you have to work together to do something there's no dm there's not, you're not connected to your character in Sea of Thieves. You don't care about your boat, really. It respawns. And still, if a guy comes onto your boat and just starts blowing up barrels and he's supposed to be on your team, you hate it and you log off the game and you go away. If my home game that I'm running as a DM, where my players have been playing for three and a half years and are level 16 and 17 now, we had somebody, some, you know, guy come into the game and be like, I cast Fireball on myself here in the middle of the abyss and I start shouting and screaming and I'm going to take off my pants. You know, like if somebody did that, I would just be like, well, no, you didn't. You didn't do any of that. You can't play with us ever again. <laughs> it's like a pretty scary, it, it almost feels like that there needs to be in, in order to really uh, like accept that kind of uh, super open and fluid uh, people passing in between games. There needs to be a commonality of setting and a commonality of rule structure that at least fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, I don't know if it fully applies because there's so much given to the DM. There's so much flexibility given by the rule set of fifth edition to the dungeon master. That's like, you can, you know, like the rules, like yesterday my players are in the abyss and they're going towards uh, this demon Lord's uh, theater where this party is raging and walking across the stone bridge as the magma uh, like warps the air around it from underneath them and this massive pile of bodies climbs up to this monument. And I was thinking, what happens when a player falls in this magma? there's no rules for falling in magma, right? The, there is in Tomb of Annihilation, it does like 40, 10 damage or something like it, it really not what magma would do to you. And uh, I was actually reading a Dungeon Master Workshop article um, about what happens when you fall in magma. And he, he was like, if you fall in magma, you turn to ash. That's what happens. Like you're done, you're done. It doesn't matter who you are. And there are, I, but I get to pick that at my table, right? As the Dungeon Master, I get to pick what happens when you fall in lava. I don't want you to turn to ash. So let's say it does 20 D 10 damage. But let's say in your game that you're used to, it does 40 10 because you played Tomb of Annihilation. You come in my game and you just jump in the magma. And I'm like, sorry, bud, you're fried. And then you get you get upset. You know what I mean? So I wonder where, um, I wonder what sort of uh, filter you could use to be like, hey, we play a tough game. Uh, we play like this. This is the kind of people that we're willing to have. You can't be a racist. You can't be, you know what I mean? We don't like it if you cuss a lot or whatever it might be. Um, to, to, to be able to filter that in, to stop from like griefing kind of, or people coming to your game to be like, I want to, or, or having a DM, sorry, I'm just like blowing up with ideas from yeah, what you said. The, the having a DM that, that everyone's like, I want to go to that guy's game because he just gives out legendary random, <laughs> legendary magic items that I could put in my thing and then go back to my home game and be a freaking God. You know what I mean? Like I, it makes like a really interesting uh, question about the rule structure and how to make that like live organic, made up on the spot experience something that is rigid enough to support a global community playing within the same worldview um while still being flexible enough to feel like dungeons and dragons so 
That's the balance which uh, is difficult to find. I mean, uh, I haven't played uh, much, if any, really, uh, of uh, the Adventure League D&D games they offer. Yeah. But when I you mean, come in the idea that you're going to play together with a very large number of people, uh, you start putting on red tapes here and there mm -hmm. and developing a an economy of things and and suddenly i mean that's that's the case with most multiplayer online role playing games you join there and you're like you're like this big he hero but in reality you you just a rando amongst 3000 people who pick the same class and the same abilities you you don't feel like you're the center of the story because because you're not uh, I, I guess it, it, what it boils down to is curation. Uh, I could imagine that you have things which would be sub-hubs of interest. Because it's, it's not absolute either. It's not, oh, I do this at my table, you do this at this table. The, the, the two points of view can be very va valid. Uh, at the academy, we say, if, you have, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. I mean, as long as you don't do it as the expense of someone. So you, you can have people who are very... Uh, combat focus and others who are very role play focus. I mean, I remember uh, Ultima Online, you would have different servers and you would know from word to mouth that you should go to the server because they, they, the kind of stuff they do it matches your taste or that's where your friends are. And at the end of the day, you end up with structures which are pretty much like role playing game clubs. Except they are, they are not physical, they, jo they, don't, they don't have a physical location. You you join them because from what you read on their web page and exchanges on social media, you know, or the podcast maybe they have, you know that their way of playing matches something you are you want to engage with. Yeah, that's a really that's a really cool idea where you kind of create um, sub like the server idea is kind of like sub communities, almost like subreddits or something like that, where it's like. We want like this is like a you know a community of people that that can join or be invited into this group. So for example, like our game um, at home and uh, another game that I play with one of my coworkers and the other game that he plays, it's like well we trust all forty of these people in this kind of like sphere and any of them could join at any time. You know what I mean? Like maybe there could be uh, 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 limitations. You know you could have maybe an open server or ones that are like this is the group that we have invited and any of these people are able to play at our, our table. And we know that, you know, we know that will be okay. Um, I guess I the, that, in the end that, it's a bit, I mean, we, because at the end it's going to look like when the first person, I don't know if we have a time traveler coming back telling us what's going on in 2035, they will tell us something. Well, you think of it, it's like Roll20 meets D&D Beyond meets Facebook meets, meets TikTok. And you're like, what? But <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the idea is you've got, I, I guess you have profile, you've got links to friends and so on. And uh, it's a bit like when my uh, uh, quite older father is, oh, you posted that on Facebook. Uh, you're not afraid that your potential employer will find out about that. And no, because this is on a privacy setting. Or this photo oh, album is yeah. on a a uh, setting which is just a family so uh, as long as these things sort of work it's not it's not completely open the the platform is facebook and accessible to everyone but that doesn't mean the content on the platform is accessible to everyone all the time uh, i assume it would be something like that <laughs> rather than a yeah. word of warcraft you show up and everybody's there and you you you, you just show, you just have your your stuff lying around yeah. So, um, yeah, another thing I've been asking people is uh, to sort uh, I don't know if you're comfortable discussing uh, that. Uh, we're trying to, to do something. Um, uh, what's it? Chris from uh, uh, Darker Days Radio, the, 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 the adjective he used was cathartic. Uh, what has been your experience uh, in Ohio of uh, COVID-19, uh, if you're... Or, or did things happen on your side and are you in complete lockdown i know my understanding is that things are different from one state to to another or, or do you feel uh, about that at the moment and, and again we can skip that completely if it's something which makes you uncomfortable this no, no it's it's all right uh we uh actually like here here kind of in the states i think uh at least from what i've read uh, our governor in ohio was very uh, quick to act on a lot of this stuff. Ohio, um, in comparison to most other states, was the first to 
enact some of this, you know, business closures and uh, the stay at home orders and stuff like that. And we were at the front line of a lot of this stuff and, and one of the first few states to do this stuff. So uh, me personally, I feel uh, it, there's like, there's like some comfort in that in knowing that at least for us, our, uh, our, our officials, our elected officials and, and people in the government have been kind of one step ahead. You know, some of the neighboring states around us, uh, uh, Kentucky and and some some states like to the to the south and to the east of us uh, aren't in lockdown as far as I know they they haven't enacted a lot of stuff they're they're still not really worried about anything so I'm not sure what the right answer is here because I, you know it's not my job to figure that stuff out and and I just don't have the expertise but I, at least personally I feel like we've been at the front line of some of this stuff and really you know I know that uh, it's affected a lot of our local businesses and. Uh, it's, it's been just something that that's, at least for me, that's like what we're focused on is just supporting each other as a community here in Columbus and, and just kind of uh, trying to be as helpful as we can to, to our neighbors. And, and um, you know, that, that's at least been my experience with it. So, yeah, I was in, uh, uh, I was actually in a tattoo shop getting um, a tattoo, an, an older one that was just an outline shaded by a good friend of mine who's a, a tattooer. And while I was in there, Logan texted me and said, as of close of business tonight, all barbershops, tattoo shops, cosmetology places, nail salons, all are, are closed until further notice. And I told all the guys in the shop and just saw their faces like, crap, you know what I mean? Like, what do we apply for? How do we deal with it? And they all started talking about it and trying to figure it out. And um, I'm very uh, fortunate to, um, I, I already work remotely for a company in Boston. So I work on Zoom. I'm it's supposed to start 48 minutes ago. Um, and I and I just, I do this all day. You know what I mean? I speak on, on Zoom all day. And and um, and so my job has been, for the most part, unaffected. And there's small effects, of course. But uh, having friends in service industries, having friends um, that, uh, that are uh, particularly our, our contractors, things like that, whose work has gone away is, um, it's a it's a difficult um, trade off to watch, and it's it's a, a hard thing to figure out how to support. Where it's like you know your skill set is something that's strictly like a, a in person type of an activity, right? Like you can't get a long distance Zoom uh, haircut from somebody, so it's difficult to support your barber. You know what I mean? You can't get uh, a, a a lot of these um, types of things um, at a distance and. I really appreciate um, the work that's done to keep us uh, to, to, to keep us safe here and to keep the disease from spreading, keeping our hospitals from being overwhelmed, all of that stuff. But then simultaneously, um, it does put a lot of people in, in very tough situations. And it, um, you know, the government's doing some things as far as like giving uh, uh, checks to people and stuff like that to help support them. Um, but the, uh, the the trickiest thing seems to be uh, unemployment filings for uh, for for people who are uh, 1099, which is like a, a, a tax status. People who are uh, contractors. Mm -hmm. So like a tattoo artist works for the tattoo shop, but they don't get a salary. They just yeah. they make their own money. Yeah, they're yeah. they're officially self employed. And so <clears throat> our <clears throat> friends are me. yeah yeah. So our friends who are barbers, things like that. Um, it's been difficult for them. My my father's an Uber driver, and he's he's still driving right now, but. Um, that the other thing that he does is uh, teach at substitute teach at schools and the schools are all closed. You know what I mean? So just seeing the way that that's affected our, uh, the, the, the workers of Ohio has been, has been interesting. It's a, there's gotta be a, a, a trade-off all the time, you know, where it's like our, our safety and the, 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 the hold back of the spread of the disease or, uh, people being out of work and not being able to get the things that they need. So, um, it will be interesting to see how they like, how they proceed to, uh, to deal with the, the economic impact of that. But, um, I, I do agree with Logan that we, we had some fast action and I think it's of course more important that we stay alive than that we keep our jobs, but it's still really hard to see, you know? Yeah. But sometimes keeping your job is, is also uh, what, what's staying alive. Thing. And I, it's, it's interesting how it highlighted how the, the financial, uh, uh, safety of, uh, most individuals in society, uh, has an impact on the health and safety of, of, of everyone uh because uh we here in uh, in the uk what happened is somewhat quickly the government said that they would contribute that up to 80 percent of the salary of employed indiv individuals so that would be uh up to 2.5 k pounds per month uh but it was very quickly highlighted that this 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 not covered the, the self-employed 
and uh, since the 2008 the proportion of self-employed individuals are jumped through the roof there's so many of them so so there's been pressure now for them to be included so as well by the same protection but uh, apparently it will happen but not until their first paycheck should be in june but but then yeah what happens if you're a uber driver and you got some symptoms and it's uh i mean on one hand sure you're putting other people's life at risk but if it means you won't be able to pay rent or buy food uh it's uh it's it's a very very tough call uh i mean yeah so it's yeah hopefully you will find solution through that it but it's it's kind of weird uh we uh, yeah, my wife uh she's got a, an employer who told everyone to work from home very early on and they're, they're multinational it was very impressive uh, so we self quarant um, social distance quite quite early I've been unemployed uh, but uh, it's funny now you've got two different types of unemployed people you got the unemployed people who lost their job before COVID-19 and they paid 80% of their salary and you got unemployed people like me who are just the basic unemployment uh job seeker allowance which is already uh much welcome but uh if my wife was not working good luck uh, on anyone surviving on that so but it's yeah. um it's interesting how it's highlighting uh yeah issues in society and, and to see uh, how things will will move forward <laughs> yeah <laughs> really yeah and i think that that's a lot of where uh crowd control was born out of you know is that there's there's not um we can't always trust or even expect the uh, the government to just figure it out and, and tell us what to do and keep us going. And so, the, you know, where we saw a necessity was uh, we, we actually created uh, I, I created something like this uh, locally as well. Um, and both of these ideas, crowd control and, and this uh, idea that I had that we did in Columbus uh, kind of happened simultaneously. I, I created the directory for crowd control. And at the same time, I, I was actually working on a directory of local businesses here in Columbus. Uh, you know, the catering companies, barbershops, uh, uh, food vendors, artists, all, all kinds of people who are out of work and saying kind of, you know, these people are affected by these shutdowns, but here are services that they're still offering. You know, so this restaurant is offering takeout. This tattoo artist is, is selling art. Um, you know, this this company who sells gifts and stuff is is allowing shipping or curbside pickup and trying to create a, a directory of local businesses here. And so part of what I think, you know, I think helps a lot of the situation is, is just community action. And uh, I think we know that there are very, I, I don't know that there are very many small uh, tabletop businesses who that is their sole income, who that's their sole job. A lot of the businesses in the tabletop community uh, at least the smaller ones that we're we're trying to represent. It's you know it's something that they do on the side, and it's a passion. And we recognize that it's maybe not as important to their income as this small business over here, this caterer who's been shut down. But at the time, it is because we don't know. You know, their job may have sent them home with, you know, no no way to get unemployment if they're self-employed, anything like that. So anything that we can do whether it's locally or whether it's, you know, internationally with small businesses of tabletop businesses or any other hobby we support uh, anything that we can do to support small creators right now is I think at least for me personally, and I know Remy as well, like any dollar I spend right now, I'm trying to be very conscious of where that goes. Is that going to somebody who this is going to directly affect their livelihood? Because I, I would rather spend it supporting, you know, a, a community, whether it's local or global as opposed to spending my money on Amazon or eBay or, or somewhere like that, because that money doesn't necessarily affect, you know, my fellow American or my fellow citizen, no matter where they are, you know, France or UK or anywhere, I would rather see that go into someone's pocket. Um, and I think that's one thing that we can do uh, personally to help right now is just, you know, being conscious of where we're spending our money and making sure that we're doing something to support someone who, who may not have it as good as us, or who may not be able to figure out the whole unemployment thing yet, because, the, you know, just like with the convention stuff, it, everyone's learning as we go. I mean, no one knows how to handle this. And so um, some of us can just be conscious in, in other ways. And I think help hopefully uh, affect that. So. Well, and on that same token, like 
anything that Storm Giant has done so far has made us drastically negative money. We have made no money at all. We have only lost money by paying artists that we think are cool to make cool art for the stuff we want to make. Like we've, we've sold a bunch of copies of our PDF, like really exciting amount. We've sold it a, a bunch of t-shirts, but it still doesn't even break even for the art that we do. Um, and, but like supporting those artists, like we still have, we still are in work. Logan and I still get to work right now. Not everyone gets to do that. And being able to, yeah. being able to support those artists to keep creating stuff, being able to, uh, like just spend a little bit of time to try and get some attention to some other people um, that may actually uh, make profits from what they do is like that. That's the, this is uh, the way that I can see us helping, you know, like we crowd control, everything is free. Nothing like signing up for a booth is free. Coming to any yeah. of the talks is free. And like, we don't care. We don't, we don't care about that. Like the whole reason that we started storm giant was that Logan, Logan ran a Dark Sun campaign for us. Uh, it's kind of, uh, we trade off who's DMing. And he, he made a like uh, kind of an altered Dark Sun write up for our table. And it was a 65 page PDF with freaking pictures in it. It was gorgeous. And I was like, dude, how long did you spend making this thing? Like, we need to show other people this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And like, and, and I make, you know, I, I work on things and write all of these elaborate stories and we come up with all these crazy tables and mechanics and stuff for our table. And we're like, well, let's just give these to, if we're going to make them, we might as well share them. You know what I mean? And uh, our whole goal has been like, let's try to break even on being able to hire artists for each issue of the looking glass. And that's it. It's like, if we could break even on the art and the maps, we'll be stoked because then we're just like, we're getting to make stuff that looks beautiful that we can be proud of. And that, uh, like, We've had a couple of people tell us that they played the adventure and they're running it, you know, talk to us personally about running the, uh, the first adventure at their table. And the feeling is freaking crazy to know that like this weird stuff that we came up with, that we worked on art with these guys. And like we, we wrote and spent all of this time laying it out and putting it together that it turned into like a memory that exists in someone else's mind at their table. That's the value. Like, I don't, I don't care about anything else. And I think that like, because we're okay right now and and we're 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 not um you know it, it, it this is the time to be able to use the extra energy we have the extra like pent up boredom that you have at the end of the day when you can't leave your house and do anything to try to support the people who aren't okay you know like um and uh i don't know i don't know if anyone is going to make any money from crowd control i don't know if anyone's going to anyone's booths i don't know if anyone's showing up to any of the talks i don't know <laughs> But it's like, what, what else can we do? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's the best, it's the, it's our best try at, at trying to help out. And, um, and I yeah. think the cool thing to see is the fire that everyone else has to help each other out too, is what has made it into anything at all, you know? And, yeah. it, and it's not, a, it's not us. It's like Logan made a website on Squarespace that took him like a day. And then it just grew into its own thing. And it's because of the community's fire. It's not like, it's not because of us or, or any real yeah. like economic thing you know yeah and that's a you know remy and i were talking about it the other day it's we don't know you know you you see conventions like gen con and uh and uh comic con and if you get a booth there you generally know you can expect to make some sales and we don't know if people are going to make sales from this i mean we, we really hope they do and we're doing everything we can to make that possible but if one guy makes one sale because of crowd control then all the work that we put into it is worth it. Cause like, that's all we want to do is we, this is time that we had that we would have otherwise wasted. We would have been playing video games or just been, you know, doing stupid stuff. So why not do something helpful? I mean, if this one guy over here sells his supplement and he makes 20 bucks, then I, I'm happy with everything that we put into it. So I, I hope it will be more than that. And I, I truly, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that it's not just one guy selling one thing. We're going to try to make, <laughs> make it a lot better than that. But if that's all it is, even it, it's all worth it. So. Well, you know, I when when I discuss with the people going to, to conventions, even uh, somewhat large publishers, like, like we got Modifius here in London, uh, those who make money going to a convention uh, are very few and very lucky. Most of the people going to convention, even big ones, often uh, they're happy to break even because it's uh, something to to expose themselves. So at least uh, yeah. something like code control, because it's free, uh, it's low, low uh, in my business, we call that uh, capex uh, capital expenditure yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. the front end cost 
is very limited so to break even they they don't have to to sell as much and if they uh, do sell quite a bit uh, hopefully the, the the delta is better uh yeah i'm, I'm all back in my work of b doing business cases for uh, <laughs> yeah. urban developments but uh yeah uh remy you wanted to add something uh yeah i actually just want i just had to say my team meeting for work actually is supposed to start one minute ago so i need to jump out and go to work um uh, because i do have the the blessing of being able to work i want to make sure i show up for it um but and you guys can continue talking do whatever you want i know we started a little late but i just wanted to say i really really i've had an awesome time talking to you and um uh if you you know reach out to us about anything uh any I will, you have anything you might need let, I, let us I will know. I will definitely try to hook you up with the RPG Academy because you you you're frigging neighbors <laughs> it's ridiculous yeah it's ridiculous. yeah I want to know about Catacon yeah <laughs> it's the beauty of the internet but at the same time it's a bit ridiculous that it's me from the faculty in London the only one not based in uh, the US <laughs> or even Ohio uh, to, yeah. to be <laughs> chatting with you but yeah it makes me very happy to add you today uh, I, I was it it was a pity that uh, I could not uh, participate more to code control itself and uh yeah th so thanks for me uh i'll let you go and we're gonna close with logan okay. because actually we're close to the one hour mark okay cool all right bye everyone thank you oh and my my thing is all messed up now uh the <laughs> uh what was i about to say uh so logan uh yeah we approach to the of the one hour mark do you have uh, anything left to plug? Uh, and uh, if not, it's going to be a uh, goodbye to the people watching this. No, I don't think so. Um, we do have crowd control coming up this weekend. So uh, for anyone that, that wants to check it out, feel free. There's a place where you can sign up to play uh, play games. There's uh, going to be there's a streaming schedule on the website where you can check out some of the streams. What's the address uh, we for the website? Else. Because I, I Googled it oh, yeah. and, I, and I found the Eventbrite, but not the website. Yeah, it's crowdcontrolexpo.com. Great. Easy. E -X -P -O. Simple. So, yep. Amazing. So that's it? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Great. Thank you so much for joining, right. Logan. And uh, Remy yeah. is not with us uh, anymore. Uh, please, people who uh, tuned in on YouTube, and we got a, a few new f subscribers. That's very exciting. I don't know if most of you used to be listeners of the Rollist podcast or main show, but I do encourage you to go check us out on our website rollyspot.com or uh, iTunes well, it's not called iTunes anymore it's Apple Podcast uh, Google Podcast Spotify uh, if you type uh, the Rollist you will find us there we got a lot of good content this content here is available on Twitch for a limited time uh, it's available on YouTube indefinitely for free and if you want the audio version to listen uh, on from the comfort of your daily commute of which you might not have much at the moment uh, <laughs> if you want the audio only you can find it in the patrons patrons only uh, audio feed of our patron page and uh, anybody anyone support uh, allows us to do things a bit better to do more stuff like I'm gonna this is getting a bit more serious so I need to work out the, the template here in OBS instead of, of doing things like a, a some kind of barbarian I will try to be inspired by my engineers tonight at cyberconf who seems much more professional yeah if you speak french do tune in tonight at 9 p.m paris time 8 p.m uh, british summer time for a panel about ordering podcasts and streams thank you again so much logan from uh, storm giant games yeah thank you and uh, yeah uh, see you all uh, hopefully monday for yeah well, i think we will head to russia on monday to for Dasha, who you might have heard on one of our episodes, she's from the London RPG community, but she had to head back to Russia for a little while. So we're going to check back with her and see what she's up to. Cheers, bye.